Okay, I think we're ready to get started. So what we'll do today is uh, kind of finish up the background information on water. Uh, next week we'll start getting into talking about groundwater and how water interacts with our geologic world. But before we get there, um, I think it's useful to understand a lot of the properties that water has and where those properties come from. Because we will be dealing with water and its properties all semester. Uh, so that'll be the first half of class. In the second half of class, I have a quiz on conversions and volumes and things like that, um, similar to the example quiz I gave you last week. And we'll do that in the second half of uh, class, as well as go through a few of the um, problems that gave you guys some difficulties last week. So that's the plan for today. So let's look at water as a molecule. We all know that water is H2O, but it's how it's put together chemically from an atomic standpoint that really determines a lot of its properties. So we have an oxygen and we have a couple of hydrogens. Now one thing about this water molecule is that the atoms are bonded in a geometry that is a little weird, okay? So this angle that's made between these two hydrogens is about 105 degrees. Now, if you think about a lot of uh, geometric shapes, think of a rectangular prism, basically a box, right? Every angle is 90 degrees. And think of something like a triangular prism. A lot of the angles there are 120. 105 is not an angle you see in a lot of stable geometries. And in fact, if you think about it, 105 is sort of right in the middle. It is right in the middle between 90 and 120 degrees. What that means is that it's really difficult for water to make a geometric shape that's stable. And that becomes important in a little while when we start talking about some of the properties it has. So the first thing that we can think about with water in terms of how it behaves as a molecule is, let's just start with the most obvious thing is that it's small. like most molecules. And in fact, it's approximately, it's just a little smaller than one angstrom. An angstrom, if you remember this from your physics or chemistry class, it's one times 10 to the minus 10th meters. The second thing is that it has this 105 degree angle between the hydrogen atoms. And because of this 105 degree angle, it doesn't create stable geometries. What it can create are some crude, poorly formed hexagons which require a 120 degree angle, but this is 105, so it's not perfect. So it creates these crude hexagons in solids. In other words, when it turns to ice. But again, not perfect ones. And the result is, is that the structure is inefficient and takes up more space 
than a efficient or well-built or well-constructed geometry might be. And one of the results of this is that, and this is something you probably know, is that ice, the solid form of water, expands by about 10% over liquid water. So as you pass below that freezing point, these molecules are going to try to orient themselves in the most efficient, tightest way possible, but they just can't form good geometries. They start to form a hexagon, and then it doesn't quite fit, and you'll have this one molecule that's all sort of cattywampus in there. And the thing is, is that it just ends up being a larger, more efficient space. And that's one of the reasons why ice expands when it freezes. A third aspect of this molecule is that it has what we call dipoles. Anybody remember what a dipole is? Something you may have talked about in chemistry. Maybe didn't spend a ton of time on it, but maybe just mention. Anybody remember it? Yeah, it means that within that water molecule up there, the electrons are not well balanced. In fact, what happens is this end of the molecule ends up with a tiny negative charge. We'll talk about why in a second. And over here on the hydrogen ends, we get tiny positive charges. So basically, these dipoles are slight charges on the atoms that arise from an unequal distribution of electrons in the molecule. And in this case, you can see that that slight negative charge is around the oxygen. That means that the oxygen is sort of hogging the electrons. Remember, electrons are negatively charged. And when two or more atoms bond together, those electrons are going to move around those different atoms according to some properties that the atoms have. And we're going to talk about this in a second. Basically, what's going on here is this oxygen wants the electrons more strongly than the hydrogens do. So it kind of hogs them, it grabs them, it keeps them nearby. And with all those electrons hanging out around the oxygen, it gives a little negative charge to that side of the molecule. And then over here with the hydrogens, because the oxygen is hogging the electrons, the electrons aren't hanging out over by the hydrogens. So if the electrons aren't there, then if you think about what a hydrogen atom is, if you look at the periodic table, it's basically just a proton, positive charge. So let's talk a little more about these dipoles. So these dipoles arise, as we said in the previous slide, 
from an unequal distribution of electrons. And the reason that the electrons aren't distributed equally is because different atoms have a property called electronegativity, which is a measure of how strongly an atom can attract electrons. I'll hand out a chart next week, I'll probably put it online on the website, that has all the electronegativity values for all the different elements that we have. But for now, I'll just give you some of the more common ones. You don't have to memorize these, I'll always give you a chart, and they're pretty simple as well. So electronegativities, range in value, from zero to four. Zero means that the atom is not electronegative. Easier way of saying it is that it does not want any electrons under any circumstance. So if you look at our periodic table, which is up over on the side of the uh, classroom there, which of the elements up there simply do not want electrons? Say that again? The noble gases, you're right, the ones over on the far right. They have a full outer shell, if you remember back to your chemistry, right? So they don't want to lose any electrons, and they certainly don't want to gain any electrons. They are just happy as clams being just as they are, okay? So everything pretty much in that group, way to the right of the periodic table, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, they all have electronegativities of about zero. So think about, look up at the chart there. Think about lithium, number three on the periodic table. And think about fluorine, number nine on the periodic table. Between lithium and fluorine, which one really wants the electron? I know I'm taking you back to your chemistry, but that's what we do here. Fluorine, right? Because it's one short of having a full outer shell. And it's small. Fluorine's actually pretty tiny. As it turns out, the tiny atoms are the ones that attract electrons more strongly than the big ones. So as it turns out, I'm going to draw a crappy sort of a periodic table here. I'm not going to put in all the different elements. I'm just going to sort of draw what it sort of looks like. Do this, go down a couple of rows, go over, go up a row. So this row right here has electronegativity of zero, that's the noble gases. Fluorine is right here. Fluorine has an electronegativity of four. It's the most electronegative atom out there, okay? And the electronegativity values tend to decrease as you move from right to left, 
and from small atoms to big ones. All right, so let me just give you a few electronegativity values here. Fluorine is right around four. Oxygen is around 3.4. Hydrogen is about 2.2. Carbon is about 2.5. Nitrogen is about 3.0. These are approximate values. All right, so let's say we bond together an oxygen and a hydrogen. Between these two, which is the more electronegative? You can look at the values I put on the slide here. Oxygen, about 3.4. It's actually pretty highly electronegative. It's one of the highest ones, right behind fluorine. Hydrogen, 2.2. But there's a difference, isn't there? There's a difference of about 1.2. So if you look at oxygen up on the periodic table. If you remember back to your chemistry, it's going to have six electrons in that outer orbit, right? To fill it, it needs two more. So it, it wants some electrons, right? That's why it has such a high electronegativity. It wants to fill it up and it's pretty close to doing so. Hydrogen can go either way, right? Remember hydrogen, small atom, that first orbital around hydrogen has two electrons. Hydrogen shows up with one. So it can kind of go either way, right? It can either gain another one or it can lose the one it has. So it can, it can go both ways, no problem. So it comes up against this oxygen and the oxygen really wants it, right? So when these two bond together, the six electrons that are in oxygen's outer orbit grabs this one from hydrogen and tends to keep it pretty close. So what happens are the electrons are going to kind of hang out more around oxygen than they are hydrogen. And that's what's going to give a bond that has these two elements present a little dipole where most of the Electrons are going to hang around oxygen, and they're not so much going to hang around hydrogen. Now, hydrogen does have some electronegativity, right? Got a value of 2.2. It's pretty high. It's not as high as oxygen with 3.4. But every once in a while, the, for a brief millisecond or so, the electrons might hang out by hydrogen for just a brief period of time. But averaged out over a long period of time, most of them are going to hang around oxygen. So that's where the dipoles come from. So let's look at carbon and hydrogen, which is a really common bond in organic molecules. What is the electronegativity of carbon? 2.5, right? 
what's the electronegativity of hydrogen? 2.2, right? They're pretty even, they're pretty close. Slightly more electronegativity with the carbon. You have a difference of 0 0.3 in this case. So in this case, sure, carbon's slightly more electronegative than, than hydrogen, so it's going to have the teeny tiniest of dipoles. Be hard for me to even write it smaller. And hydrogen's going to have the teeny tiniest of positive dipole. Okay? But they're pretty even. You guys had chemistry, right? What do you remember about what are the different types of chemical bonds that you remember from chemistry? Everybody remembers ionic and covalent, right? Everybody remembers that. We're going to think about it a little different. In other words, if you take a look at the periodic table, with the exception of the noble gases, everything has some electronegativity, okay? When it's bonded, that means that it's capable of holding the electrons, maybe for just a little bit, even if it's bonded with something that's more electronegative. The fact is, is that there is no such thing as a perfectly ionic bond. Ionic bond, going back to your chemistry, what did it mean when they explained it to you? What, what was an ionic bond? Yeah, one of the elements grabs the electron from the other and keeps it, right? And then whatever element does that is going to have a little negative charge, right? And the one that gave it up is going to have a little positive charge, and then they're going to be held together electrostatically because positives and negatives attract. That's kind of what we have going on here, but this is an imperfect world, and there's no such thing as a perfectly ionic bond because all of the elements have a little bit of electronegativity. So what I'm going to show you here is another way to think about bonding. So over here, we're going to have electronegativity differences. And over here, we're going to have what we're going to call percent ionic character. If it was a perfectly ionic bond, the ionic character would be 100%. What's a covalent bond, according to your chemistry class that you had last semester, this semester, or five years ago, or whenever? They share. they share. So thinking about electronegativity, what would be a perfectly covalent bond? What would you have to have? In terms of electronegativities? They'd have the exact same. Think of a carbon bonded to a carbon. They both have exactly the same electronegativity, right? One's going to be pulling, the other's going to be pulling, they're going to be pulling equally. Any millisecond, all the electrons might be around one of those carbons, but then the next millisecond they might all be around the other carbon. Average it out over time, they're going to be equally distributed. So if there's no difference in electronegativity, does it have any ionic character? No, it won't have any ionic character at all. If you have an electronegativity difference of 0.1, that's going to give you an ionic character of about half a percent. In other words, that's a pretty covalent bond. It's not perfectly covalent, but it's pretty close. The electronegativity values are about the same. Both of those atoms want the electrons kind of equally. I'm just going to write these values out here. You can sort of take a look at 
And I'm going to put them all, I'm going to jump up here on this last one, the 3.1, which is about the most different that you can find between two bonded elements. And that will give you a 91% ionic character. And now we're going to sort of break this into three categories. You've heard of covalent, ionic. We're going to add a third car uh, category because it's an important category when it comes to talking about water. So if the electronegativity difference is greater than 1.7, we're going to call that an ionic bond. It's not perfectly ionic because the weaker of the two in terms of electronegativity still have some electronegativity. If that electronegativity difference is 0 0.5 to 1.69, We're going to call that a polar covalent bond. What that means is that the two atoms will share the electrons, but they're not sharing them very evenly. One of those two that are bonded together is going to hog the electrons more than the other. And finally, if your electronegativity difference is less than 0 0.5, we're just going to call that a covalent bond. If it's 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, or 0.4, it's not a perfectly covalent bond, but it's pretty close. All right, so I'll give you a couple bonds here. Let's go with OH what we have in water. What's the electronegativity difference between oxygen and hydrogen? What's the electronegativity for oxygen? I gave it to you on the previous slide. 3.4, what is it for hydrogen? 2.2, the difference equals 1.2. What kind of bond would that be? That's a polar covalent. What about carbon-hydrogen? said a minute ago, real common bond in organic molecules. What's the electronegativity for carbon? Anybody to shout it out? 2.5. Hydrogen is 2.2. Difference of 0 0.3. What kind of bond? Covalent. Another way to think about this is that when you have a covalent bond, the dipoles are probably not strong enough to matter in most cases. There might be real tiny dipoles there. Anytime you have an electronegativity difference, you're going to have tiny dipoles. But when you're in this covalent category, they're so weak that they're not going to affect the properties of the molecule much at all. When you're in the polar covalent range, then the electronegativity difference leads to quite a few differences in properties. 
And that's what we're going to get to next. First of all, any questions on this? How many of you have seen this electronegativity stuff before? Okay, so you guys have seen this a little bit. Great. All right. Well, one thing you probably remember from chemistry is that the type of bonding that you have present in your molecules has a huge effect on the properties that those molecules will display out in nature. So let's talk about water. We know water is a polar covalent substance because it's made with oxygen-hydrogen bonds. So the strong dipoles in water are going to affect the properties. And the reason is, is that the strong dipoles means that you have strong positives and negatives on the ends of these molecules. And what that allows for is strong electrostatic attractions, attractions between positive and negative charges between molecules. And that's going to affect properties. And in fact, one of the properties that it affects is the melting point and boiling point. So because of the strong dipoles, water has a higher melting and boiling point than it would have than if it didn't have those strong attractions. So just to sort of set this up, so in general, light molecules have very low melting and boiling points. Right now, in our environment, we're sitting at about 70 degrees Fahrenheit, right? Some things are solid at this temperature. Metals are solid at this temperature. What state is water in at this temperature? 70 degrees? Water is a liquid, right? So some things are liquid. And then what is gas? What sort of gases are floating around us right now? What's the most common gas in our atmosphere? Nitrogen. Nitrogen. Take a look up at periodic table. Nitrogen's a pretty small molecule, right? What else is in our atmosphere? Nitrogen. Oxygen also a pretty tiny molecule, right? It's hydrogen in our atmosphere. There's noble gases in our atmosphere. So the things that are towards the top of the periodic table tend to be gas at this temperature. Water, though, is a liquid at this temperature. And the reason it's liquid is because it has these dipoles. It has really strong attractions that are holding it together. So water is light, 
Under normal circumstances, you'd expect it to maybe be a gas, like CO2 is a gas. But because it has these strong dipoles, adjacent water molecules can feel those dipoles and they cling together electrostatically. So water is a light molecule, but the melting point and boiling point are actually quite high. for a light molecule. And that's because of the strong attractions between the dipoles. So that's the first property that is affected by these dipoles. Another way to think about it is that you need more energy heat in this case to break these electrostatic attractions between dipoles. Okay, so that's the first set of properties that are affected by the dipoles. Any questions on that? Okay. Another set of properties, and this is a property that you've heard something about with respect to water, is its surface tension. Water is a liquid that has a very high surface tension. Not all liquids have high surface tension. And basically it's the same idea is that the dipoles are creating strong attractions between surface water molecules. This next one's a big one when it comes to understanding how different pollutants enter water systems and behave in water systems. And this particular property is something called solubility, which is something I know you've all heard of. Anybody have a definition for me for solubility? One of these things that you've all heard of, but sometimes not easy to explain. Uh, capacity of a substance to dissolve solute. There it is. Perfect. Ability of a solvent which is typically a liquid, but it doesn't have to be. Whoa, not sure what happened there. Let me try that again. All right, oh, there it is. Of a solvent, typically a liquid. To dissolve. Solute. Can gases dissolve in liquids? Yes. 
Yes, give me an example. So like um, when you have a river of like just constantly moving water, yeah. it'll uh, absorb like oxygen and stuff from the air and that'll oxygenate the water. So yeah, so water can take in oxygen, a gas, right? And that's what fish extract from the water. Fish don't like swim around looking for bubbles, <laughs> okay? They're not in search of bubbles. What they do is they allow water to move through their gills, and the gills can extract the oxygen that's actually dissolved in the water. It's invisible. Can solids dissolve in water? Give me an example of one. Sugar. There's one that's even better than sugar in terms of that water can dissolve more of it. Water actually has a hard time dissolving sugar for reasons we'll talk about in a minute, but it does dissolve a fair bit. Salt is one thing it dissolves really well. If you put salt in water, mix it up well enough, pretty soon that salt disappears from sight, right? But it's there, it's broken apart and it's being dissolved into the water. What about other liquids? Can you think of a liquid that dissolves well in water? First of all, name something that doesn't dissolve well in water. Oils. We're going to talk about why in a minute. How about a liquid that does dissolve well? I'm going to have some after class. Alcohol. <laughs> alcohol dissolves very well in water. And there's a reason for it. And the reason is how things are bonded together. This is something I want you to remember. It's really easy in terms of remembering how bonding affects the way things dissolve. And like dissolves like. What that means is that polar substances like water dissolve other polar substances. Nonpolar substances dissolve other nonpolar substances. All right, let me give you an example. I think everybody has this. All right. So which of these two substances will dissolve in water more easily? Nitrate, which is NH3. Basically, you have an N with an H, and another H, and another H. Or methane, which is CH4. We have a carbon in the middle, and it makes a little tetrahedral shape. Hydrogen, and hydrogen, and hydrogen. And that little dot means it's sort of going back in three dimensions. Hydrogen. Okay, we said before, like dissolves like, right? 
So which of these is most like water in terms of its ability to create dipoles? So you're going to have to look back at your notes to figure this out. I'll give you a second, see if you can do it on your own, and then we'll walk through it. Okay, so over on the nitrate, we have bonds between nitrogen and hydrogen, okay? We know dipoles are created by differences in electronegativity. So what's the electronegativity values on these different atoms? First of all, what do you have for a nitrogen? 3.0. And what do you have on hydrogen? 2.2, 2.3. Three, somewhere in there, okay? So difference of about 0 0.8. What about carbon, hydrogen? We already know hydrogen's about 2.2. What about carbon? 2.5. Difference is about 0.3. What was the electronegativity difference on water? What's that? 1.2. 1.2? Which is more similar to water? These two are, right? They're both polar covalent substances. They both have strong dipoles. What that means is that the dipoles on water are going to feel the dipoles on nitrate. They're going to feel the tiny dipoles on methane, right, as well. Methane has super tiny dipoles, right? Water's definitely going to feel them. But water's going to be way more attracted to the strong dipoles on nitrate. So one way to think about that is the strong dipoles on the nitrogen-hydrogen bond will be more attracted track, can't spell. to the strong dipoles on the water molecule. Okay. All right, let me give you another example. All right, I'm going to draw a molecule here. You have to think about this one. All right, everybody good on this so far? All right, let me draw up this molecule right here. This is a 
Okay, so I drew you a little molecule right there. I want you to look at it, think about it, and tell me if you think this will dissolve in water. And why? Okay, what do you think? Yes or no? Is it going to dissolve well or not, and why? Who wants to give it a shot? I don't think it'll dissolve well. Why don't you think it'll dissolve well? Because most of the bonds are between carbon and hydrogen, and the electronegative difference is very small. So, over in this part of the molecule, let's say right here, right? All of those are bonds that aren't going to have much of a dipole, right? They're covalent bonds. So when water comes up here, yeah, there might be really weak, tiny little dipoles, but the water, actually what the water is going to feel most are other water molecules, right? You got to think of this as like there's going to be millions of water molecules in this system, and there's going to be millions of these. Sure, these have teeny, teeny tiny little charges on them because there's slight electronegativity differences. So the water might feel them, but there's going to be another water molecule right next to it. And it's like, oh, well, that one's much stronger. I'm going to, I'm going to snuggle over next to that electrostatically. But what about right here? What do you have there? It's basically the same bond that's in your water molecule, isn't it? So this is going to develop a pretty strong dipole, right? So if you have a water molecule sitting right here, it's going to feel that stronger dipole, right? In fact, it's not really even going to be able to tell the difference between that end of the molecule and another water molecule. Actually, this ends up dissolving really well in water, but it's only because of that side of the molecule. So you're technically, half the molecule isn't going to like water, right? But this part of the molecule really likes water because it's just like water. This is actually an alcohol. And alcohol is defined by that little OH that's hanging off of an organic molecule. There's different kinds of alcohols, but alcohols dissolve well because one end of that molecule is for all practical purposes the same thing as the bonding in a water molecule. So the answer is actually yes. All right, I'm going to give you one more. What about... Take me a minute to draw this. Okay, there's a big organic molecule. Is it going to dissolve well in water? Every bond is what? It's either extremely 
small differences in electronegativity. Remember the difference between C and H puts it in the covalent category. Or you have carbons bonded to carbons. No difference in electronegativity. So this will not dissolve well. This molecule right here that has eight carbons with nothing but hydrogen, that's called octane. What do you remember? Where do you remember octane from? It's gasoline. Does gas dissolve well in water? Not at all. And finally, I guess I'll throw one more out here. Let's say we have methane. All right, here's some methane. Well, methane dissolve better in water or octane. The methane's going to, it's all carbon hydrogen, right? Which is really similar to all the bonds that we have up in octane, right? The octane and the methane, the bonds are almost identical in terms of their electronegativities. So this octane isn't really going to be able to differentiate the methane from another octane, and they're all going to mix together really well. If you put a bunch of water in there, remember water has really strong dipoles, What's the water going to seek out? It's going to seek out other water molecules with really strong dipoles, and they're going to sort of cling together. And that's what happens when you mix oils and water. The waters are more attracted to other water molecules, and they just sort of shoulder aside all the molecules that don't have strong dipoles. So they don't mix well at all. They don't dissolve together at all. So again, like dissolves like. Methane is going to dissolve really well in octane because they both are covalently bonded. Okay, I'm going to do one more property. This one really doesn't have too much to do with the dipoles, but it is a property that is extremely important when we start talking about wells and pumping and groundwater. And it's that water, liquid water, is essentially incompressible. Liquid water is essentially incompressible under pressure. You can't squish it. You can't make it smaller by squishing it. Now the reason that's important is that deep in the earth there's lots of pressure. The deeper you go into the earth, the more pressure there is. And the pressure originates from gravity pulling down all the rock that is over the top of it. Now when we're going to look at groundwater systems here in a couple weeks, groundwater moves through pores in rock. That's how groundwater moves. It finds these little openings that are connected and it moves from one pore to another. Deep down in the earth, remember, there's lots of pressure. But if there's water in the pores, then those pores cannot collapse under the pressure because the water can't be squished, so it's there as a support system. But what happens if you suck all the water out of the pores? What's in there then? Air, Air gas. And one thing we know about gas under pressure is that it's 
very compressible. So if you extract too much water out of your aquifer and replace incompressible water with very compressible air, those pores can squish and close. And then what happens to the future viability of your aquifer? It can't ever transmit good groundwater again. And that's something that's happening nationwide. As we lower the water table, the water table marks the boundary between the saturated rock below and the unsaturated rock above. Unsaturated means it has air in it. But if you lower that water table, all of those pores that used to be filled with water that couldn't be compressed, now is going to have air in it, and they can be compressed really easily. And what's happening, our aquifers are compacting all over the country. And there's two problems with that. One is that once the pores are squished, you can't unsquish them. And that provides no room for future water to move through. The other thing, too, is that if it squishes, it reduces the volume of rock. And what will happen is the whole land surface that lies above will start subsiding. It will start sinking. And in places in California where they've been extracting groundwater for 40 or 50 years, the actual land surface in some areas has dropped 50 to 100 feet. And it doesn't do so evenly. You know, and a lot of times when you're settling an area as humans, we bury important things in the ground to protect them from humans like gas lines, water lines, pipelines. And if the area settles unevenly, those pipelines and gas lines can break. And if you put a building on top of it, the building can founder and settle unevenly as well. So you're getting tremendous amounts of damage from water being extracted, the aquifer is collapsing, and it all points back to this property of water where it's essentially incompressible. Now, I should note that if you want to get really technical about this, water is slightly compressible. We can ignore its slight compressibility for groundwater when you actually calculate various movements of groundwater with compressibility and without doesn't really matter. One place it does matter is in the oceans. I don't know what just happened to that. If water was truly incompressible, the oceans would be about 30 meters higher than they are today. So you have to have an enormous amount of water for compressibility to matter. But since this is a class in groundwater, for groundwater applications, we assume it's incompressible. Which you should be happy about because all the equations that we use to track ground